Well, thank you, everyone. Really, uh, really happy to be here again. Uh, second year at Singapore. Really lovely city to be in. Um, I want to speak about building apps that scale to large number of users. In some of my previous lives, <laughs> I worked as a Web2 developer building apps and had the privilege to work with some apps that reached 10 million users a month. And trying to bring that same perspective into Accord and helping to bring mass adoption to the PermaWeb. So we're going to talk about some of the aspects that we're adopting at Accord and how you can use that and bring that into your apps. So the first point is it's really applications that drive customer uh, growth and value. It's, it's, you know, the end users are using apps, and it's through that we can find critical mass. So I want to talk about a few things. So I think it was about 12 years ago I was uh, first introduced to Bitcoin and got to work with early developers and built tools back then. And one of the things that, looking back, I can recall is that there were a lot of different small applications. I can almost call them hobby apps, little apps that people have built to try to solve little problems in the ecosystem. Um, here's just a few of them. But today, now we have, you know, attained a, a degree of critical mass. And I really believe it's because of the more centralized applications, more centralized exchanges that bring the high-level user uh, experience that allows the, the critical mass to come. And so looking at our weave today, we see kind of the same thing happening. There's the same thing that's brewing. We've got the same level of developers building these apps looking to bring that user adoption. And what we, you know, we're still a bit small, we're still new, we're still starting out, but you see the trajectories there. You see that there's this you know, new space opening up, there's new potential, new possibilities opening up. And so one thing I wanna highlight here is the PermaWeb Arweave ecosystem does something that's really quite unique. It's combining the token, it's combining data, and it's combining your application together on the same chain. And that opens up so many new possibilities to work with. You know, think about like, you know, social networking, think about gaming, think about content monetization, as we've seen earlier today, different protocols, different apps providing that. So uh, kind of like orient your mind towards these ideas, and I think there's a lot that can come from that. So to kind of like summarize that little section of uh, the presentation, you know, think blockchains bring infrastructure, as we've seen. That infrastructure brings apps that we have seen, and now with those apps, we can bring the users that we're hoping to support. Um, the second part, or the second point of this talk is to talk about the specific kind of like functionality and features that we're used to in the Web 2 world and think about how we can bring that into the Web 3 world. So in the presentations that I often give about Arweave, I use this paradigm um, where to not think about Web 1, Web 2, or Web 3 as kind of like a linear progression, saying that Web 2 obsoletes Web 1 and therefore Web 3 obsoletes Web 2. Rather, thinking about the paradigm shifted as something that embraces and extends each paradigm. So obviously, we use Web 1 technology in Web 2. And in the same way, we're going to use Web 1 and Web 2 technology in Web 3. And so that's why I present it more as a spiral, something that embraces the paradigms forward. So thinking about that, um, if you look at a lot of the Web 3 applications today, they're usually single page apps connects to your wallet, and that's about it. <laughs> and you do some kind of operation. There isn't the high level degree of you know, notifications, you know, easy on wraps. And so some of the things I've listed here is like, you know, if you want to build Web3, we need to think about reducing the friction around wallets, key signing, encryption. That's not an easy problem to solve because you're dealing with a lot of security issues at that point. The UX principles, which we see touches of, but not really fully developed like we do in Web 2, you know, things like easy login, uh, paying with fiat, which we hope one day will be obsolete, but for today we still need to support that. Fast loading times, get the caching right, get, get the data to the user as quickly as possible. Access accessibility, being able to support a wide range of different users and each one of their you know, unique kind of like dispositions. Of course, Going down deeper into the functionality, we can think about searching, notifications, localization, multi-device support, personalization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, but ultimately, all this comes down to is supporting your customers, creating value for them, and that allows for the growth that we're looking for. So kind of mentioning a little bit about Cord, you know, we've tried to approach those aspects um, 
try to bring the Web 1, Web 2 aspects into the Web 3. Uh, some of the things that we designed early on was we designed our own wallet because we want to have better control, better usability around key signing and things like that. We offer a type of wallet where you can log in with your username and password while still having a recovery phrase behind the scenes that you can use to perhaps reset your password and things like that. But having that username and password means that no, no matter what device I'm on, I can always access my account. Um, second thing is something very basic and very normal like notifications. I mean, most apps today that scale well have this kind of functionality. And as I mentioned before, you know, a top up with a credit card. You do not need to own AR tokens to use Accord. You can just sign up and top up with your credit card and pay and go. So these things, um, it was kind of interesting. I want to talk a little bit about, I just want to tell a little story. So like in the beginning when we were using Accord, some of the early people that came to us were like, oh, we want to be able to pay with our wallet and we want to be able to do this kind of with the Web3 mentality. But that kind of faded out pretty quickly. And what we saw was kind of the inverse. We saw a lot of people coming to say like, oh, we really appreciate being able to pay with a credit card because it was convenient at the time, right? I don't expect that to be the case forever, but I do, I do think and believe that you need to pay attention to the times that you're in and work with the people at that level and bring them forward. So this is, this is our uh, approach. Um, so now this next point, um, I think my number may be wrong, but anyways, <laughs> I want to kind of talk about um, a more controversial subject, um, decentralization versus centralization. It's something that I often talk about because um, most of the time we think of it this way. We think of it as opposing uh, paradigms, opposing ideas, opposing forces. And you know, to be fully decentralized, we have to kill the decentral. We have to kill centralization, or vice versa. And I think that's kind of a disservice to our users to think that way. Um, because if we really want to get more nuanced about it, we can have a discussion about all these different points, which I will not go over here because we're short on time. But you can really get into the nuances. And you can see that really, you know, they're not really opposing. But rather, you know, there's another way of thinking about it. And I wanted to put this quote here from, uh, well, it's Steve Jobs quoting Alan Kay. Alan Kay was an original designer working at Xerox Park, I believe, on the early like user interface. And he said that people who are really serious about software should make their own hardware. What he's saying there is that by having more control over the entire stack of computing, you can provide a much better user experience. And that, I think, was fundamental in what Steve Jobs was trying to pull off, always driving this idea. And if you look at Macs today, they control the entire stack. And because of that, they have this high, high level of user experience. So rather than thinking about centralization and decentralization as opposing, I like to th put them kind of more on like layered approach, where as long as we can have a decentralized under, um, you know, the layers under are decentralized, we can ensure that we have this kind of like transparency and, you know, all of the Web3 kind of things that we want, but we can also think about centralizing above that to provide value for the customer. And ultimately, we can get into more niche markets by providing more specific um, solutions to different markets. So, <clears throat> so kind of looking at the stack that we've uh, seen many projects present before uh, today, you know, um, the lower layer, so the blockchain layer, the protocol layer, and actually some of the infrastructure layer can all be completely decentralized. But knowing that decentralization is not going to solve our customer's problem, we can then look at how centralization can be adopted for providing customer value. So here I kind of talk about how Accord is positioned where we have our own protocol at the protocol layer, but then we kind of centralize on top of the infrastructure and the apps. We are working to, to, um, to bring gateways using uh, RIO, gateways uh, technology, and focusing that on providing the, the data that our customers are wanting, and then allowing our customers to build apps on top of that infrastructure. And by centralizing that, we believe that we can provide that high-level uh, user experience. So to not leave it just at that, I kind of want to also think about this middle way between the two, so that we think of centralization, decentralization as a dynamic. 
And I think there's some like high level questions that we can use to kind of like test to make sure that we're kind of on that path. So the first one is obviously, are, you, are we really solving a customer's problem? Or are we just throwing out new technology just for technology's sake? You know, and that's not always a clear, uh, there's not always a clear answer to that, but it's a question that I think we should always be asking ourselves. If we're really oriented towards customer growth and customer value, really ask what problem are we solving for them? If we're not solving their problem, it's probably not very interesting <laughs> for them. The second one, which I think is in the spirit of all of the R weavers here, is if a cord goes away, will our customers be able to continue? Will they still have access to the data? Will they still be able to, um, to function? And thinking even more broadly, can we, uh, can we say the same for someone 200 years from now or 1,000 years from now? It's a very, it's a very um, both philosophical but also a very practical question. And I think that that's another th kind of question that could guide us uh, toward the right way. <clears throat> and the third one, again, this is uh, kind of another discussion that can go deep, but if you're going to launch a token, does it really provide value for your customer? I think tokens are usually often you know, um, released as something that supports the startup or maybe supports the protocol, but maybe lacking thought about the customer and how the customer will use that token and how will that you know, ultimately provide them value. So these are kind of three high-level questions that Accord we're always thinking about. And actually, when we started, we were um, intending to launch a token from the beginning. But then when we asked ourselves this question, we, we didn't see the, you know, the justifying answer. So we've actually postponed the token until we feel that we have that right uh, answer. So kind of building on those principles um, and kind of like you know, talking about Accord a little bit, um, I want to introduce a project that I've been working on um, with Jeffrey here. And it's called R-Tape, and the idea is to build um, on top of Accord's infrastructure to build a uh, mixtape for music on the PermaWeb. And this is leveraging like UDL and UCM and some of the new uh, content monetization protocols coming out. But the idea is that we can create kind of a mixtape. We can like plug in different NFTs of music um, and create and, uh, and allow like tastemakers and curators of music to create these mixtapes and share them online. But what I, the reason why I'm mentioning this here is because all the functionality built in our tape is built on Accord's um, API, Accord JS, and some of the user interface. So bringing in things like the username and password, bringing in things like notifications and all those kinds of things. And so that's kind of how we see that we may be able to bring the next few hundred million uh, users to our weave. So I want to say thank you and leave you guys with a little high cue. So the PermaWeb calls clear, apps unlock destiny here, Web's future is near. So thank you very much, and please sign up uh, for a cord. Uh, you get 250 megabytes for free.